30 million families by the year 2030. Um, World System Builder, the organization that came up with this campaign, and we align ourselves with World System Builder. Um, so we want to educate 30 million families by the year 2030. And the reason why we want to do that, um, Lizette, is because we believe that financial education isn't an option. We believe it's a necessity, um, especially when you live in a society that the underlying economics of that society depends on finance depends on finances right when you have things like inflation and interest affects you it's good that you know how those things work so we're committed to educating and empowering 30 million families by the year 2030. so be part of the campaign that's revolutionizing the financial services industry where we build with a system that bridge financial education and financial independence so Let's jump right into it. Welcome. Let's see how many we have now. We have 14 of us. Welcome to our workshop. Um, like I said, we have six of these workshops and um, this is number six, but you can continue and continue learning. We have these workshops five days a week, Monday through Friday, and we have sometimes three times, of, three times in the day. Like for example, today we had a 2 p.m. workshop with an 8 p.m. workshop, and now we have this 10 p.m. workshop. Um, and then tomorrow we have a next set of workshops going. Thursday we have a next set of workshops going. Friday we have a next set of workshops going. You could continue to come back and educate yourself, and we welcome you to come back and educate yourself. So let's get started. So every single day, would you, would you agree with me that every day we're flooded with information? Zoe, we're actually in the information age. So every single day we're flooded with information and many people, Nazir, many people, they offer financial advice, but they're not licensed. They might read some financial education book, create some content online, great at, great at marketing, and they're offering financial advice, but they're not licensed to do it. And they don't have any industry experience. They, Van, they never sat down with a client to see what the client goals are and then try to analyze their goals and then implement something that is beneficial to the client. And those people that's in the traditional industry, because we're trying to build a new industry, what they do, um, Raquel, is they narrowly only focus only one or two aspects of your personal finance. So let me give you an example. Let's say, Josh, you run into a mortgage advisor Chances are they're going to want to probably focus on helping you with a mortgage. Let's say, Maria, you run into a real estate advisor. They're going to probably want to help you for buying a house, real estate, right? Let's say you run um, into a insurance advisor, lead. They're going to probably want to talk to you about insurance. And let's say you run into an investment broker. They're going to probably want to only focus on getting you investments. So what we're finding is we're finding that those that's in the traditional industry they narrowly focus on only one or two aspects of your finance. So what these workshops are designed to do is to help you look at the total picture. We want you to have a holistic approach when it comes to your personal finance. So our workshop, they're designed in such a way to educate and empower you so you could be your own money manager. We want you to understand how, how things work, and we want you to be able to feel confident when you're making financial decisions. So if you control your finances, most likely, Josh, you, can, you control your future. So let's get started. What are you guys going to learn today in this workshop? Um, we're going to talk about preserving your wealth and estates. You would have probably get from one of the other workshop, how do you accumulate wealth, right? So let's talk about preserving it. So we're going to learn step by steps to begin preserving your hard work, which is called your estate. We're going to look at strategies to transfer and preserve your wealth. And we're going to ensure that your last wishes are prepared and carried out currently. So this is what we're going to learn together. Okay. So, you know, at the end of the day, everyone has a story. Every single person, there is now how many of us, 17 of us on here. We all have a story. Our parents have a story. Everyone have a story, right? So when we look at 
stories, we could see that when it comes to caring for elders or loved ones, I remember a good friend of mine, and when we were younger, um, her mom got sick and um, she was an only child. And would you believe, Josh, that my friend, you know, we used to always go out and, you know, we're young, having fun. And my friend, you know, on the weekend, she has to go and take care of her mother. She had to be the caregiver for her mother, right? And she had to, she did this for a couple of years and then until her, her mom passed away. So every, it seems everyone has a story when it comes to caring for their elders, even in my family itself. Um, when I look at it, Raquel, you know, my grandmother, she, she's living with my mother right now. So my mother is taking care of her mom, right? So everyone has a story. I'm sure your parents have a story. I'm sure you probably have a story. So, it, it, so when it comes to, um, people in, that stage of their life you know your parents or grandparents people moving in you know like i said my friend she had to put her career on hold just so she could take care of her mother right and we talk about conversations about what to do after someone passes away so it seems everyone has a story so when we talk about what can we do um, what can we do when it comes to this situation how can we prepare ourselves what we can do is we can start making some decisions right now, right? We hope all of us, all of us, all of us hope to live a long life. Isn't that true, Dylan? We all hope to live a long life, but the truth is any of us, Kareem, any of us can pass away at any time. So right now, Julie, or Julianne, right now is one of the greatest time to develop a strategy when we're young and healthy before it's too late. So when it comes to developing a strategy, we want to start looking, asking ourselves questions like, as you're building wealth right now, as you're in your income producing years, you're going out and you're working and you're earning an income, as you're producing income right now, you ask yourself some simple questions. You could think about this for your parents as well. Um, who will I leave my legacy to? If something should happen to me, if tomorrow, Gabina, I, you know, come to my house and I'm driving and, you know, I'm walking down the street and some guy wheel off the road and run into me and that's it for me, who would I leave my legacy to? How can I protect all of my hard work? And how will I be remembered? You know, what impact will I have on this world? So as we're building up wealth, these are some of the questions that we can ask ourselves. And we can start making decisions now. So our workshop, what we want you to understand is your financial foundation. We want you to understand like building a house, you must build it from the ground up. And we start with proper protection. We, we talk about debt management, emergency fund and investment. But today, what we're going to focus a little bit more on is we're going to focus on proper protection as a way of, um, dealing with your estate because we're talking about protecting your legacy and the longevity of your wealth so let's talk about proper protection and how we can use proper protection um, when it comes to the estate planning now we have to understand that wealth comes in three different phases gabina the first phase is what we call our accumulation phase this is what I called your income producing years. This is where we're, most of us on this call are probably in this phase. This is where we're working and we're producing income. Now, what we do, Lizette, when we're producing income is of crucial matter because it's this phase that is going to affect the new, the next two phases of our life. Some people says one of the best thing you could do in the accumulation phase is find a way to make money work for you as well. So when we accumulate and we reach the peak and we're, we're no longer, Jazala, we're no longer in our income producing years. Now we have to stop working and we might be retired. Now we're going to be in our distribution phase. This is where all of the things that we had work and accumulate, all of our assets, you know, all of our pension plans, all of the savings accounts, the investments, 
This is where those things is going to start distribute back to us when we are no longer in our income producing years. And we're basically enjoying the fruits of our labor. So while we're in our income producing years, Anna, something might happen and we might not get back all of the things that we accumulated. So that's where we want to be able to transfer the rest of it to our family. So as you could see, the three phases is very crucial, but the main phase is the accumulation phase. Because when I look at it, Alan, is if we're not careful in the accumulation phase, the distribution phase and the estate transfer phase is probably not go the way we want it to go. So the question is, shouldn't we have the best strategy for all three phases? That's the question, right? So when we continue here, the fact is, when we look at it, how many have a will or a trust? We you know how many have someone who knows where those do their documents are, and we have who you know who would know what needs to be done if either me or my spouse or one of our loved one passed away, right? So these are questions we could probably ask ourselves when it comes to that. So let's talk about building a legacy now. It doesn't matter the size of your estate. If you have a bank account and you have a dollar inside of that bank account, you have an estate. Your estate is all the things that you own, right? So when you look at that, Lizette, it doesn't matter the size of it because we go to work, right, Jazala? We go to work and we work hard for the things that we own. So it doesn't matter the size of it. What matters is that it goes to who we want it to go to, Henry. Its transfer is of paramount importance because at the end of the day, that's our legacy. That's what we went to work for, right? So I wouldn't want to go to work and build up an estate. Again, it could be my bank account. And it end up going somewhere else than I where I would want it to go. Because at the end of the day, patience, that's our legacy. So when it comes to our legacy, we have to ask or we have to look at three simple points. As you're building up wealth, you want to think you want to make sure that a couple things are happening, right? You want to make sure that you are protecting yourself and your assets while you're alive while you're living. You want to be able to have a clear organization and communication to who is going to be receiving your legacy. And you want to be able to pass on your legacy to your next generation. Now, Henry, that legacy could be $10 in my bank account. It's still my legacy. Does that make sense? It's still my legacy. So we want to be able to look at these three simple points and make sure that these three simple points are something that we, 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 we manage. So guys, would you believe, would you believe that, you know, they did a survey back in 2021 and over 57% of Canadians do not have a will. Now, if we know how important a will is, this number should be zero. So, would you believe that whether you do a will while you're, while you're alive or not, a will is going to be mandatory? Is that we pass away with a will? Or, Sierra is going to ask whoever is manager estate to go prepare a will. It has to be done. Is that we do it for low cost and know where we want things to go? Or one is done for us? Without information, the zero. Would you believe that if everybody knows that this number would be this high? That 50 cent of Canadians don't even have one? So that means if my mom patients doesn't have a will, and something happens to my mom and I'm dealing with her estate, 
They're going to ask you to go get go to a lawyer and create a will. One has to be done. Right? And then we look at it, we said 55% of people that's over six, over age 65, they are they, they do not have an up-to-date will in place. These numbers are too high. They're way too high. Right? So true education, we want to see if we could get these numbers down. So let's now understand what these things are because all of these are part of our estate planning. Now, estate planning is a process. You know, it's a process of determining the distribution of our assets upon our debt. It also covers the management of our personal affairs in case we're in capacity, in case we can't make any decisions, something happens to us. At the end of the day, estate planning is not for wealthy people, right? Estate planning is for almost anybody. Like I said, if you have a bank account, you have an estate. So it's not just for wealthy people. And it's for everybody. It's for smart people. It's for people that prepare, right? Um, when life happens, there's two types of people. You know, when life happens, there's two types of people. There's the prepared and there's the unprepared. If something happens, if an emergency happened next year, there's two types of people, Jenny. There's the prepared. And there's the unprepared. So I want you to imagine this scenario, Kareem. Imagine this scenario. A husband and a wife worked hard, was able to save up about a million dollars in their hours fees. And they get a babysitter. They hired a babysitter. They went out on a dinner date, right? And on their way home, the car slid they both pass away. Now, if one of them pass away, Julie, and it's an RSP, then it rolls to the to, to the spouse. Make sense? So if the husband passed away, the million dollars will roll over to the wife. If the wife passed away and she's the one that with a million dollars, it will roll over. But in this scenario, Kareem, they both pass away. They're both in a car, car flipped over, both passed away. One million dollars in their RSP. Guess what happens? They have to prepare a final tax bill. And because it's a million dollars, it's going to be reported as income. That pushed them up into the highest tax bracket. Now there are about 50% taxes on that million dollars. So there's $500,000 going to the government. The rest goes to the kids. They say it's two kids. Now, each kids are probably 50-50 split. Now, one child get 250000 another child get 250000 In this scenario, Jenny, if you talk to one of the child and say, do you get two fifty? the government got five hundred. who is the biggest beneficiary? Huh? Who is the biggest beneficiary? So I want to imagine that scenario. Now, is there something we could do that we could learn that could even change that scenario. No, you made the call. You're in control. Wouldn't you like to make the call? Wouldn't you like to call the shots to make the decisions when it comes to your estate planning? When it comes to your hard-earned money? So let's talk about, you know, because at the end of the day, guys, like I said, when life happens, there's two types of people. There's going to be the prepared. And there's going to be the unprepared. So which one do you want to be? Because if you don't have a plan, the government is going to have one and we may not like it. We may not like it at all. Right? So estate planning, let's, let's understand estate planning. Number one, to ensure that my property will go to whom I choose. If something happens to me, they learn, I just make a will. And I, in the will, I tell where my property should go and to whom. Right? Number two. If I want to avoid the probate process, and you might say, where does that word come from, Omar? I never hear the word probate tonight. Well, probate is a process where when someone passed away, um, it, 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 um, and they have, they, 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 and, and things doesn't go right to a beneficiary, it goes to a process called probate, right? And you could, you guys could probably look up probate. And um, probate, they, they're going to probably want to freeze the assets and make sure that things is all good so we know where things are going to go. And it's, it's, it, it, it slows down 
um, the estate transfer process. And some people, some people, Lizette, by the time the probate is settled, by the time the estate is settled, it might take 12 to 14 months, if not more. So if I want to avoid the probate process, I can consider a trust. I could look into a trust. Uh, if I if I want if something should happen to me, and I want someone to make decisions for me, because I trust that person's judgment. And this is the person. If I'm sit up in the hospital and something is wrong and I can't talk, I don't need this person to say anything. I want this person to make the decision. Well, I need to prepare a personal directives. I would not want my family to have to try to make decisions for me. And I want to have one person make that decision. I could do a personal directives when it comes to my health. It comes to my finances. Let's say I travel across and I'm out of the country for months. And let's say I'm still up in the hospital and I trust one person to take care of my finances. Then I'm going to give that person authority to a power of attorney. So when we look at estate planning, we're starting to see the will is important, the trust is important, the personal directives is important, and the power of attorney is important. I'll give you an example. I remember this 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 couple, and um, they traveled over to the states. I think they were in, in Phoenix, and the husband, you know, you know, Jazala, the husband, like his stomach was kind of like really cramping, really bad. And it was so bad that he's like, no, 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 I have to go to the hospital. When he went to the hospital, I think he like ruptured something and he couldn't talk, couldn't do nothing. And the wife was there, right? It was appendicitis he has. Um, and the wife was there and the wife was trying to say he likes this and he likes that. You know what they said? Do you have a personal directives? Do you have a power of attorney for his health? She didn't. She couldn't make any decisions for him. So that's how important some of these things are. So these estate planning documents and, you know, there's other documents like you know, if your kids are going to travel, you have a travel consent form, you have guardianship, all these different documents. You know, you want to make sure the beneficiaries are always updated. You know, sometimes you buy an insurance plan and you have one child and then two years after you get a second child and you did not update the beneficiary and only one child is going to probably end up getting all of the insurance money. So we always want to make sure that we update the beneficiaries, okay? There's some other documents that we can look at to make sure that um, they're available and easily updated. Now, without proper documents in place, it's going to be very stressful. If you have children and they remarry, you know, the assets, you know, would be very stressful. The assets could go to your current spouse. Does a step-parent have any obligation to support a biological children? We don't know. Right. So if you leave your assets to your child and they're minor, they're going to need a trustee. Um, did you name a trustee? No, because a court could appoint a guardian that will take care of the assets. And we might not even like who the person the court, the court, um, appointed. So, you know, and if you travel, you want to make sure that your documents are in place, is in place. You know, you want to have travel insurance, little things like those. Now, let's make sure that your documents are in place in case of a medical attention. So, like I said, with a couple, you know, they were traveling, but if they had like a power of attorney and a documents in place, then, you know, then they would probably know what's going on. So all of these things, what they do, they just give you, your parents, your family, a peace of mind. Because what is the cost of not having these proper documents in place? Oh my goodness. Lizette, it's going to cost a lot of time, a lot of running around. I'll, it could cost a lot of money. And it could cost some people their sanity, Henry, right? So what's going to cost the next generation, right? So these are things that, these are simple documents that we could sit down with a licensed professional and get these documents going because it's one of the most thoughtful and considerate things that we can do for our loved ones. You know, Gabina, one of the best times to think about doing these things is right now when we're young and healthy, and we could just do it, get it over with, and have it done. So let's talk about some wealth. We just finished understanding the estate documents that's needed. And if you're listening to my voice and you don't have any of those four documents, let me let me go back to them. 
Um, guys, if you don't have a will, a trust, a personal director or power of attorney, please sit down with a licensed professional and inquire about it. Please inquire about it. Okay. If your parents don't have any of those four, please sit down with a licensed profession and professional and inquire about it. Let's talk about some wealth transfer strategies, right? There's three different ones we're going to cover today. There's more, but there's three different ones we're going to cover. We're going to talk about segregated fund. We're going to talk about a Lira versus a pension. And we're going to wrap it up with some cash value life insurance, permanent insurance, whether it's a whole life insurance or universal life insurance. So if you had been to one of our workshops, workshop number five, we kind of go in depth on the segregated fund. So if you have never have never been to workshop number five, I welcome you to go to workshop number five, find out when workshop number five is from the person that invites you on, and you can attend that class. So I want you to remember, if you have been to that class, just remember the seg funds. And what they do is they combine the growth potential of a mutual fund with an insurance protection. So a segregated fund is a mutual fund that is created by insurance companies and it comes with some guarantees it has an insurance protection it has its pros and cons you go to workshop number five you'll get to understand the pros and cons of a segregated fund but let's talk about the advantages of a segregated fund being used for estate purposes okay because segregated fund is great but in some situations it might not be the best thing right so let's understand it when it comes to the estate process what are the advantages of a segregated fund? Well, your principal is guaranteed, right? Um, up to a certain level, because there's different types of guarantees. Um, you have a debt benefit guarantee. It has a potential creditor protection, meaning that if you already have money in your segregated fund and you run into a lot of trouble and you have to do something with your, with your creditors, that money could be protected. It's potential creditor protection because you can't, have money and then you know you're going to do something with, with your credits and then you can put all your money in a sec fund you know it won't be won't be something you can do but the good thing about a segregated fund is you can name a beneficiary on your account and by naming a beneficiary the the money that you have inside of your sec fund could go directly to a beneficiary without having to go through that probate process right it doesn't have to be caught up in the estate it could get directly transferred over to a beneficiary, similar to like how our insurance work. Now, you know, we just, I just understand that COVID just happened. And a lot of people was a little bit stressed out <laughs> in COVID time. So a lot of people, they, they switched their career. Um, some people got laid off, never got called back. And maybe they had pension at their work already. Right, Henry? So let's talk about Lira versus pension. So you're working, Henry, and he, you know, let's say you're a nurse and COVID is like, oh my Lord, this is too much. And that's it. I turned the towel. I'm going to quit. And you had a pension, right? You had a pension at your job. Now, when you leave your company, whether you leave, they lay you off. When you're leaving your company, you have a pension plan. You're going to have a choice at that moment in time. You're going to, they're going to give you a choice if, so do you keep your pension in the plan and collect it when you reach your retirement age? This is known as a deferred pension, or you could take your pension with you and you could be in control of your pension with the help of a licensed financial professional. You could transfer your pension into what we call a lira. And it allows you to transfer the cash value of your pension to a lira. This option, though, guys, is only avail is usually available up to a certain age. After a certain age, they might not allow you to transfer it anymore because they want to protect your retirement. But these are the two options you will have, right? When you leave a work and you have a pension plan at that work, you could keep the pension plan there, and you could collect it when you when you reach your retirement age or you could transfer it over to a Lira and your advisor might say, they might use a word called rollover, okay? So let's talk about a Lira. What is a Lira? It's a locked in retirement account. So what is this locked in a retirement account? It's a registered investment account, like an RSP. It's designed for the accumulation of pension money outside of your traditional pension plan. So the reason why it's locked in is because your pension 
is already a locked in money. So they were hoping that the money is locked away from you until you reach retirement. So now you leave that job and you want to transfer that pension money over onto your control, you and an advisor, then the money needs to stay locked until you retire. So the fund inside of a Lira, sometimes it could be an LRSP, they will normally become available or unlock um, upon retirement. Now, the good thing about this is when you transfer it, it allows you to manage and choose the type of investment funds that your pension is going to get now. If you would leave it in the, in the job, then you don't know whatever fund that was there, that's the fund that's going to continue. But if you would roll it over and have an advisor work with you, you and the advisor could put different investment options to make your money grow a little bit better. But let's go back to the same couple, right? Same couple. Remember they had RSP of a million dollars. Let's talk about this couple, right? They have a pension plan. And let's say the pension plan, the husband has the pension plan, right? And the husband, somehow something happens to me, passed away. Depends on when he passed away, right? And you have to probably talk to a licensed professional. Depends on when he passed away, they could probably give the spouse 60% of what the pension is. Could be in a lump sum. If he passed away while he was during retirement, they just continue to pay her and they'll give her a lower amount. But let's say this person a transfer his money to a lira and he had taken control over it when he left his job and he passed away because it's a lira a hundred percent of the balance will go to his spouse now, if you have these two choices and you know how these choices work which one would you choose right which one would you choose so let's continue here. Let's talk about protecting our, those assets. Now that we have a plan to build your assets, let's look at how you can protect and maintain your wealth, right? Let's talk about using life insurance, a cash value permanent life insurance to build wealth and transfer wealth, right? You may be able to, you may be able to use a life insurance policy to build and transfer wealth. I'm not sure if you know that, but you can. Let's talk about, there's two types of permanent insurance. There's whole life insurance and there's universal life insurance. I'm not sure if we're going to cover both of them in this module, but you could talk to your financial professional. The person in you here might be a licensed professional. You can sit down and talk to them. Everything I've told you so far, the person that invites you on, if they're a licensed professional, they could help you with everything that I've talked to you thus far. So if someone didn't invite you on here and they were licensed, you could get back to them and everything that I've talked to you so far, they could help you with it. Now let's look at a universal life insurance. What a universal life insurance is, it's a combination of an insurance plan. It has some investments in it. The investment instead of a universal plan, when it's growing and making money and it's getting growth on the money, you don't pay tax on the growth. The tax is deferred. Now, that cash value that's inside of your universal life, you could borrow up to 90% of the cash value without paying taxes. And that's like a policy. That's like a loan against the, 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 the cash value. Now, if something happens to you and you pass away, the de benefits of the life insurance is going to be paid out to your beneficiary tax-free. And one of the good things about life insurance, Nazir, is... Let's say I have, remember earlier I said, if I have $2 in my bank account, I have an estate. Well, let's say in the zero, I have $2 in my bank account. <laughs> well, if I purchase a life insurance and I purchase a million dollar plan, it instantly increased the value of my estate. I no longer have a $2 estate. I probably now have a million dollar estate, right? Um, because life insurance immediately increased the value of your estate with the insurance protection. So instead of me having $2, remember Henry, instead of me having $2 in my bank account, and now I purchase a million dollar life insurance plan, I instantly increase the value of my estate without, without purchase. So let's look at a strategy. 
So let's say at age 50, you have $500,000 in a non-register asset growing at 6%. So $500,000 at 6%, you get about $30,000 a year. So if you continue that money in the market, in about 20 years, that could grow based on the rate of return to about $1.6 million. It's a non-registered account, so it's liquid. You could cash your money out. But the thing about it, it's a non-registered account, so it's taxable upon your debt. And that amount could be caught up in your estate. Now, let's say, for example, you were to use a UL strategy instead. So let's say you said, okay, I have $30,000 a year. I'm going to deposit it into our universal life. Um, I start with $500,000, right? That's what I have. So that's my original capital. Now, that could probably get me $1.9 um, million in debt benefits. And when I have my cash value, it could probably come up to about $2.4 million of total debt. I'm going to show you an example of this, right? Um, now, the thing about this is if I pass away, the debt benefits of my cash of my universal life insurance is tax free. Um, the, the, it's going to bypass my probate. It's going to bypass the probate process. It's going to go right to my beneficiary and has potential creditor protection. So let's look at this example. This person is putting $30,000 in a year because they have 500,000 and they're getting 6% rate of return. This is an assumed 6% rate of return. Now you could see that their total debt benefit in year one is $1 million. So they had started off with $30,000, but now they have a debt benefit of $1 million. Now, when it goes to year 20, right, they have $1.9 million in debt benefit, but they have over about $900,000 or so in cash value. And this is on a 6% rate of return assumption. Okay. When you buy a universal life policy, you do have to review it annually with your advisor to make sure the assumed interest rate is you're getting the assumed interest rate. So let's say in this case, they did get the assumed interest rate and they paid $30,000 for 20 years. They have $917,000 in the cash value. They have $1.9 million in the debt benefit. The 917 is what they could leverage against during their retirement. The 1.9 is what they're going to get. So there might be some other strategies that you can use. Again, we showed you universal life, but you could also look into the whole life as well and see how it works. There might be other strategies that might be that better fit your situation. Just talk to your advisor and, um, and then find out what's your next move. So, you know, when it comes to the transfer phase, we, you know, we, we looked at the, uh, we, I talked to you about the accumulation phase. We didn't really go with that much into the distribution phase, but when it comes to the transfer phase, there's accounts that we can use that can make the transfer of our assets smoother. We could utilize the benefits of a segregated fund because it has a beneficiary on it. We could, instead of keeping our pension when we leave, we could move it into a lira, or we could look into a, a permanent life insurance strategy, whether it's a universal life or a whole life strategy. Um, we could look into it and we just help to ensure that our estate is sound, right? And we could probably answer questions like, do I know how much I'm going to leave my family? Do I know what my tax burden is going to be? Do I have a clear plan? So these are the things that we could probably look into. And, you know, when we want to make sure that our legacy is properly preserved, not only gives us a peace of mind, but also a clear plan of action. We can look into a funeral concierge plan, final expense and type of insurance. So when we have a funeral, um, funeral concierge type of plan, what it does, it helps, it helps whoever is managing the estate. No, when someone passes with patients, it's so overwhelming first and first the shock of the person passing away the second thing is the process that they go through so from the hospital declare that the person dead to where do you want us to send the body what funeral home to so then go into the funeral home to deal with a funeral home director to them sending the, the debt for them sending the the, the, the declare to cra the CRA freeze to locking up the app. There's, it's so overwhelming. So when all of these things are happening, and we could probably call, um, uh, call a concierge service to say, can you help me with this? And, you know, planning someone else's funeral is probably the last thing in most people's mind. So there's a funeral concierge, which is a service to help the client during the planning and preparation stage, 
and their family during the toughest parts of their life. So these type of funeral concierge service, they could help with funeral planning, implementation, negotiation. They could provide 24 hour assistance. They have other beneficial tools that might be helped with the in aid in the estate process, right? So, you know, sometimes these things could help calm a person down because it's overwhelming. So who will be there to help you or your loved ones, right? And then we we find out about final expense type of coverage because sometimes you have life insurance and the debt benefit doesn't really come like right away. But then when you understand the process when someone passed away, it's like two weeks. I have to have all this done. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. It's crazy patience. So if someone has a final expense type of coverage, most of these final expense coverage, what they try to do is they try to get you the payment fast. Some of them try to give it to you like in two, three days to pay for all the process proceeds of the funeral. Some of them could range from 5,000. I've seen some go all the way up to 50,000. And what it comes with is a guaranteed debt benefit to, you know, to help the surviving members cover the funeral costs and some other stuff. Most of these plans, they don't really have medical exam required. You could, again, you could talk to your licensed financial professional and they will help you with this because sometimes you have life insurance already and these plans could help. So with that said, guys, in everything I talked to you about tonight, you could reach out to the licensed professional, the person that invites you on, and they probably could give you some more information. So in summary, we can preserve and transfer our estate any size. It's the develop is developing the strategy now that's going to make the difference. So we must take the appropriate action, right? To develop a strategy that builds, maintain, and transfer our hard-earned legacy. Right? So we're all about saving your future, right? We're all about saving your future. So, you know, we don't want to worry about your future. We want to take charge. Remember, I said. When life happens, two people, it's going to be, you're going to be one of two people. When life happens, there's two people. There's the prepared and there's the unprepared. So what we want really through this financial literacy campaign is we want you to be one of the prepared persons. An emergency happened, you have an emergency fund. Something happened, you have protection. Retirement comes, you have some investments. So we want if when life happens, your financial foundation had prepared you. So if you think you can be successful and you struggle towards your goal, chances are you will achieve it. Guys, the journey will present wonderful possibilities and many opportunities to share the, that knowledge along the way. So that's why we're on this campaign. Now let's hear from one of our campaigners. Um, this is from Mrs. Ruse. She says, my youngest son and I were on our way to California for an appointment when we got into a car accident. Had I not turned the wheel in the last second, we would have gone straight over a 20 feet cliff. That sound gave me chills, but what's mind boggling was a thought of relief that came to my mind. I knew that if I died at that moment, my family would be okay. That sounds to me like a person that's prepared. Life happens, there's two types of people. This is like the fifth time I'm telling you guys, because I want this to happen for you. Life happens, there's two types of people. There's the prepared and there's the unprepared. And we want you to be prepared. That sounds like a prepared person. They won't have to think of how they will survive every day. They'll continue with their life because I have proper protection for them. They wouldn't think of a funeral headache. We have our wills in place. It's all because I was educated. I wouldn't be, wouldn't have been able to set up all these and I not join WSP and our workshop. Now, I've given you the goods. You have the information. Now, it's up to you to take the steps necessary for your future. Guys, one of the greatest miracles is that you could change your life simply by changing the way you think. And the way I would like you to think tonight is I want you to be one of the prepared persons. Right? I want you to connect to the person that invites you to this workshop. Right? If you, this is your first one and your only one, continue to come back and educate yourself. 
You could be part of it. You could ask the person, hey, you know, you the, the presenter said we're trying to get to 30 million families educated. I was on that I was on that session. Can you count me in? And they will put you in our counter and you can be part of the 30 million family educated. So you could join our campaign and bring someone to you to the next workshop. Right? You can get the books and, and, and get all the materials that we teach from. These are the other workshops that we have. But most importantly, work with a financial professional to help you improve your financial strategy. Guys, with that said, um, wow, that's kind of crazy. I finished the workshop early today. Normally, normally I talk too much. <laughs> normally I talk too much. Um, so thank you guys so much for your time. I hope that um, tonight's session was clear to you. Um, I do have time for maybe one question because we're pretty early. Um, but I hope that tonight's session was clear to you. There is 18 of us. Thank you guys so much for your time tonight. I completely appreciate your time. I know you could have been anywhere else. So I really have respect the fact that you come and hang out with us and you're educating yourself. So if there's a question, let me see, there's, there's something in the chat. Um, someone is saying, please turn off your camera if you're eating. Please be aware that it's a professional setting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know if someone was eating. <laughs> All right. So is there any questions? And Anybody has a question? No questions? Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, continue to go to the other workshops. There's there's one tomorrow. There's one on Thursday. There's one on Friday. I hope that you guys are coming away from our organization with the value that we're trying to bring to you. Thank you, guys. You guys have yourself a wonderful, wonderful time. Get back to the person that invites you and give them your opinion, give them your take. You guys have a wonderful night. Thank you, Lizette, for staying on camera with me the whole time. You have yourself a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you, Kabina. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jazala. Thank you guys for your night. You guys enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night, and I will leave you with some music. <laughs> Shake your body like a belly dancer Hey ladies, drop it down Just wanna see you touch the ground Don't be shy girl, go Vanessa Shake your body like a belly dancer